During some extensive research in the Gospels, I began to realize that the way Jesus did things and the way the modern church does things don't match. In fact, the scary statistics are that our differences between the way Jesus did it are almost light years apart because Jesus made 12 disciples, as we all know, and he lost one which he ended up with 11, if you want to do simple math. And then if we look at what the statistics are today, well, researchers say that out of 10 people that we bring into the church, we lose nine. And maybe you've observed this from your own experience. Hopefully your numbers are better than that. Sometimes it's only 80%. Sometimes it's only 50% for a time. But how long do they stay? See, we can count all these numbers of how many have been baptized and how many have been filled with the Spirit. And those are exciting numbers. But are they staying And you see, Jesus ended his ministry and he said, all that you've given to me, I've lost none. The way we're doing it, we might end up at the end of our lives turning and saying, all that you've given us, we've lost them all, but one. And that's really not our goal. That's not what we want to accomplish, I'm sure. So the issue is statistics versus Jesus' results. And then it's just like, well, he was Jesus, so of course he didn't lose all of his, but is Jesus in me? And even more importantly, am I following the way Jesus said to do it? Because he not only said how to do it, he showed us how to do it. And if we look at those stories, we can see what he did. It's not a secret. The Gospels should be our disciple-making training manual. Now, Jesus did two different things here. One is he sent his disciples out to make disciples, and he told them to use a different pattern or a different plan than what he apparently did. You see, Jesus said for them to go out two by two and make disciples, find a person of peace, okay? So we can talk about that. And then what Jesus himself did, though, so we've got Jesus right here in the middle, and he has got several all the way around him that he is making disciples of. He didn't go and find one. He told them, go and find your one person and work with that person and don't go from house to house. Yet Jesus is working with multiples at the same time, 12. So Jesus does a different model and he instructs his new disciple makers to follow a model that is varied from what he was doing. Or is it? So when he sends his disciples out, they're to go and find the person of peace. The person of peace, um, or, or the son of peace, now the concept of son of, you're probably familiar with this, but let's just review. It's like son of the devil, you know, you, you are uh, the children of the evil one. Uh, you, you inherit the qualities, or the lack thereof, uh, whatever it is. So you can be a son of righteousness, you can be a son of the darkness, uh, you can be a son of perdition, as Judas was. So Jesus says, go and find the ones who are the heir apparent for peace. They're the ones that are recipients of God's favor. They are ready to receive, basically. And and literally, he says, inquire who is worthy, which is kind of scary language. The way we think about it is, well, am I saying this person is worthy or not? But are they fitting, ready to receive God's peace? Not whether they could ever be saved or not, We're not questioning that. What we're asking is, who is it that's ready to receive the peace of God in me? Because there's been people that really needed God or were really ready for God, but they couldn't receive him through me. There was personal issues. There might have been prejudice issues. There might have been gender issues. There might have been age differences. And so they were ready to receive someone's peace, but I wasn't the person they would receive it from. Other times, there's been people who refused my peace, rejected me, And then five years later, maybe, they're ready to get right and to leave the wrath of God. And so they receive my peace. And man, we become close friends in the faith and the fellowship of Jesus Christ. So a person of peace is different than a son of wrath. They are now ready to receive God's peace. They're ready to transfer their life from being ready for wrath, which everyone is before Christ, to getting at peace with God and to live in that harmony. And when you become aware of this and as you start working with people and training your people, especially the ones that you are teaching to go out and make disciples this way, once they become aware of what a person of peace, the son of peace is like, this child of peace or the heir of peace, like I like to say, when that person is ready to receive, they will say it sometimes. I mean, literally just a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting with somebody and he said, man, I feel such peace here. We've had people sit in our home and say the exact same thing. Man, I feel such peace here. They are receiving. They're they're drinking in something that is bringing them a solution. So Jesus sent his disciples out. Man, there's so many layers to this. Um, 
I'm going to try and cover all this and not be all across the board, but when he sends them out, they go out and they do peacekeeping work. Okay, so there's a lot of talk today about getting people into our church services. We talk about church growth and having better church services, and man, we had good church. But Jesus had disciple services. He trained them for disciple services. Okay, so where today we emphasize the music and the singing and the schedule and the program and all the different things and good preaching and everything. He was emphasizing in his disciples this microcosm of what the church would be. He was emphasizing in them doing the works, the disciple services. And um, in a course that we've put together called Secrets of Making Disciples, we go into this in more detail, the practical how-to and the what and the wherefore. But in the general, again, the 10,000-foot uh, view, they're making disciples. They go here, and so they're going to cast out devils. They're going to cleanse the lepers. They're going to raise the dead. They're going to do whatever needs to be done, and they can because the person is a recipient of their peace, ready to receive them. Some people say, well, if miracles happen today, why can't you go in and clean out a, a hospital? Why can't you just you know, heal everybody that's in the hospital and empty them out? Well, are they ready to receive your peace? See, Jesus didn't do many great works when he returned to Nazareth because they didn't believe. They weren't receiving him. It's pretty much a simple, simple um, mathematical equation here. If they're ready to receive, God's going to do some works among them. And so you go in and you start working. And then he says, work in their oikos, um, or oikos. We, we talk about this, uh, this household, their world, their sphere of influence, their social group. And really, that's what it is. It's a social group. But, you know, there's discussion about whether that word really means um, a house. And so your, your person of peace is... So it would kind of be like something like this, perhaps, that you know, you'd have the regular house, and then as the sons grew up, they would add on to dad's house, and so you could very quickly end up with um, not just sons, but perhaps other relatives come, and you know, then you have this gated community. You have, a, you have a courtyard, and all these people share the same space, so to speak, though they have private spaces of their own. And again, this is very simplified, but if that's the household, this is the oikos, Jesus says, go and find someone that receives you and enter their circle and begin working there. You don't have to go from house to house. You just work with the ones that they are already connected with. That's the beauty of the thing. He did not tell him, go and find 12 people. He says, go find one person who's connected to 12 people, perhaps, or 30 so they go in and they begin working there. Now you see this happen with uh, Simon Peter. He goes to Cornelius' house and there, who knows how many people we have. He's a centurion. If he brought all his staff to that event, there could have been 100, 200 people there because a centurion could have up to 100 soldiers plus his family and his servants and all the different ones that were working in that household. Who knows how many were there? But this is how massive revival happens. So we go one by one and we try to get one at a time and then they don't stay. But Jesus taught us how to go and have a multiplier effect, that the emphasis, the, the, the effort that we go to suddenly expands rapidly. So he's got these disciples go in and they're seeing the power of God. Now, Let's scale back for a second. Take, let's, let's uh, give this guy a name here. This is Andrew, the first or one of the very first disciples to follow Jesus because John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Andrew and the other disciple, probably John, goes and follows Jesus. And they say, you know, uh, where do you stay? And he said, well, come and see. And then he invites them to follow him. And then it intensifies because then Andrew goes and finds his brother, Simon. Um, and I'm just going to do it this way for simplicity's sake. But he goes and finds Simon. And he says, we have found the Messiah. And then he invites him, so to speak, come and see Jesus. And so Simon comes and meets Jesus, and Jesus speaks to the heart of the issue. So right here, we see that Jesus does not tell him, hey, let's get something scheduled for this weekend. Are you busy? Meet me at the synagogue. We'll have a Bible study because, you know, people didn't carry around Bibles back then. Um, but no, that's not what Jesus does. He ministers to him in the moment. He perceives what's going on in Simon's heart. He sees a receptive heart, and he speaks defining words to him. 
There was no demon cast out that we are for record of. There was no healing or anything that took place in Simon's life. But Jesus is ministering peace to him, giving him a new identity, this shaky guy, as we will see through the Gospels, that, you know, he kind of comes apart at the seams sometimes. And Jesus calls him the rock. So he is defining and reshaping Simon's identity, and he's doing a spiritual work here. If you or I did this, we would call this the uh, word of knowledge, maybe, where we'd say, you know, this is uh, what God just told me about you, that you're going to be a rock, you're going to be a pillar in his kingdom. And we'd help define that person. That's, that's the spirit of God working through us in the moment. God convicted me once um, and had to work with me several times on this because I had this mindset as a preacher and as a minister and as a pastor that I've got to hear from God because Sunday morning's coming. I've got to hear from God. Wednesday night's coming. I've got to have a message for the people. And so I would pray and I would seek God and he would give me a word and it would impact people's lives. And people, of course, they would come. They, you've heard them say, hey, you know, what you said just spoke to me so much. Thank you for hearing from God. You have no idea what I'm going through, but it's exactly what I needed to hear. And in my mind, that was, okay, so this is the way it works when we gather together. When I'm behind a podium or a pulpit, that's the way it works. But at the gas pump, not so much. But God began to open my understanding that he wants to reach the person across the gas pump. Not everyone. Not everyone receives your peace. Learning to read them quickly to see if they're receiving your peace helps you know what step you can take next. But I've stood at the gas pump before with somebody, tears pouring out of their eyes as they are talking to the Lord with me, and I put my arm around him, and we're able to take that moment to Jesus right there. I didn't say, hey, here's a business card. Come and see us Sunday. I said, hey, Jesus is right here. Let's meet him right now. And of course, invited for follow-up after that. So Jesus ministers in the moment. There's another one that he does this with. Um, we've got Philip, and he goes, and he gets Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel doesn't look like he receives Jesus' peace right, around, right off. He says, uh, you know, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Jesus sees him and perceives something going on in Nathaniel's life. And we don't have the backstory. But he targets him, and I'm assuming that Nathaniel has something going on in his mind. Maybe when he was under the tree, he was reading the scriptures about Jacob or quoting the scriptures about Jacob or praying or thinking in some vein about Jacob, later named Israel, because Jesus looks at him and says, Hey, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Now, something was happening, something confirming happened here, and perhaps Nathaniel was thinking, you know, I want to be like Jacob, but I don't want to be a deceiver. I don't want to use guile or deceit. And so Jesus says, hey, a true son of Israel in whom is no deceit. And he reacts, and he's just like, oh, you are the king of Israel. I see who you are. And Jesus says, you think this is something? After this, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is why I really want Nathaniel to have been sitting there thinking about Jacob and the, the place at Bethel and how he built this pillar to God. And now Jesus says, you're going to discover even more, Nathaniel, that I am the house of God, Bethel being the house of God. Again, that's a little bit um, maybe more wishful thinking in my mind, but whatever is happening here, Jesus is speaking spirit words to Nathaniel, who at first threw up this little smoke screen of, I'm not interested in your, your preacher from out in the sticks. And the peace of God grabs him, and Nathaniel, we believe, became a follower of Jesus, probably Bartholomew, as is surmised, and so became one of the 12. So but Jesus goes on further from this. Not only does he reach Andrew and Simon, but then he begins to reach into Simon's family because he goes to Capernaum and they go to the synagogue. And when they're done with the synagogue, they're coming back home to Simon and Andrew's house, working in their circle at this moment. And, you know, they're going to put on some pot roast for him or something. And he gets there and Simon's mother-in-law is sick. And so Jesus is able to heal. He ministers to her and heals her of this deadly fever in that moment. What does this do? This creates great faith. This creates great awareness and it draws attention to others around. So pretty soon this, uh, this event, whether it was Simon's connection or the mother-in-law's connection. There's a whole house full of people. They're connecting with people all over the community. Now, how did we get here? Because Jesus focused on a person of peace, Andrew, who brought him to another person of peace, and he worked within their sphere of influence, that oikos. They began to open up to him and let him have access to their social world. So Jesus does this work, and now, let's go back to what we said before. He had 12. Well, 
conceivably, he did this with each one of the 12. He reached into their social circle, built it out, built it out, built it out. We see again, um, and we don't have details about every one of them, but with Matthew, what does Matthew do? He comes to Jesus. Jesus says, follow me. And Matthew goes out and all of his other tax collector friends, he throws a party for them and they come to his house to eat and Jesus is there in the midst. Matthew introduces Jesus to his social world. So Perhaps you've had those experiences before. If you've done home Bible studies where one person leads you to another person, leads you to another person. And that's good. That's effective. But still, they're not going to stick unless we are actually making disciples of them the way Jesus said. Because what Jesus did not do was have 12 Bible studies going. And I've done this before, had 12 Bible studies going or more in one week. And he would show up and teach for an hour and then disappear and show up at the next one and teach for an hour and, and see each one of these once a week. That's not what he was doing. It was an immersive thing. That's why I believe this level of ministry where you're working with multiple persons of peace is only for those that are full-time in ministry. And he did train up his disciples to later have a more expansive influence. We see Paul. He lists this huge list of close disciples that he has made. He had Timothy, he had Titus, he had Silas. Um, he had so many different ones that he was working with and developing them into agents of the king. And they were going out and expanding the kingdom. But the process and exactly how we do it, it's not based on uh, a science. It's not even based on a flip chart series. It is based on understanding the end result of what a disciple is supposed to be and knowing what it takes to get them there. So there's this process of uh, reaching in of the spiritual work, number one, being aware of who that person is, because a lot of times people waste a lot of time, and it feels bad to say it this way, but they waste a lot of time on those who aren't going to do this. They are not going to respond to the gospel. They are not going to let Jesus be the center of their life. And you can sit there and keep going back and teaching lessons for years, and their heart's not turning. They're just lonely, and they're glad to have a friend. So a person needs to know the difference between that. So a lot of this we cover in depth in the secrets to making disciples, and we keep adding things to it as we go along because there's so much packed into the gospels of how we're supposed to do this. But the other thing is, I find it very important that we not just rob the Bible of techniques because church growth conferences and soul winning books and, and disciple making series and so forth, some of it, so much of it robs the Bible for just a technique of how we're going to get people in our pews and how we're going to add to our bottom line, I'm afraid, many of those programs are all about. And I don't want to do that. See. The Gospels aren't just about making disciples, they're about us seeing Jesus. Once we really see Jesus, we need to go back over the Gospels again on a deeper level and then see how to make disciples of Jesus. Because it's not just the amount of work and personal space that we share with these people, but also Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, of course, in the name. But then he says, teach them all that I have commanded you. So where are we doing that? How are we doing that? To teach them all that Jesus has commanded is to go through the entire scriptures. You know, we love the story where Jesus says, there was the man who built on the rock versus the man who built his house on the sand. And the sand got washed away. There's a lot of people, their lives falling to pieces because they're building on things other than the teachings of Jesus. They are building on the best-selling book. They're building on the emotional sensation they get from good church. And hey, we need good church. But they're not building on the foundation of Jesus. They don't know what he said about these key elements. This is why we've created this series called Disciple Maker. It's a curriculum that will help your people go through the Gospels in detail so that we won't miss any of the miracles of Jesus. We won't miss any of his disciple-making moments or any of his teachings. Disciple Maker covers 52 weeks of serious, intense study. Now, if you have 20 to 40 hours a week to create your own resources, by all means, continue doing that. But this is a resource to help people who don't have a lot of time and want to deliver the best and excellence in teaching the Gospels of Jesus Christ. You're going to have seven illustrations, seven different ways of presenting the main ideas of the lesson. There's seven bullet points that come on PowerPoint slides that you can use. If you're just doing a small group, you're teaching a core group, you can teach them off a tablet, off a laptop. If you're teaching a church, you have, again, the resource that is 
at good quality, you could project it onto the screen, onto the main wall, and teach 50 or 500. In fact, one of the leading curriculums for teaching adult Sunday school or other teaching settings like that costs about $250 per quarter to reach 50 people. Our resource is less than that for you to be able to reach the entire year. So, you know, 250 per quarter, that's over $1,000 a year, and ours is less than the cost per quarter and covers an entire year. So we're very confident it's the best value that you can get, and it's the most researched and content rich, not just with information about who Jesus is, but the application of every story, every event, whether it's on the sea and they're facing shipwreck and we're learning the lesson about faith, or whether it's the rejection by the scribes and the Pharisees and we learn not to trust in our education, or whether it's just the basic principles of loving your neighbor as yourself and managing money and keeping your relationships restored, forgiving. So many things that Jesus covered there. But the emphasis that we have here as we're talking right now is the concept of making disciples who stay, getting our numbers closer to this and not keeping sliding off the chart like the statistics tell us, that we need to keep moving forward. And so that's why we've added in this extra training. There's probably 10 hours of videos in this Secrets to Making Disciples. It's a very intensive course. It covers five key steps, step by step, how to make disciples, how to develop them, how to send them out so that they continue doing the work Jesus began in us. So you've got everything that you need in that Disciple Maker course. It's well worth the money there, plus this added resource of Secrets to Making Disciples that we're throwing in because we want to help Bible teachers not just talk about these things, but then put it into action in their local groups. And again, it's going to adjust again to your setting, whether you're working in a prison cell or you're working in the inner city or you're working you know, in a rural area, there's different things that are gonna adjust and flex just as we see Jesus do, just as we see with the Apostle Paul as he went into different communities, we see the adjustments made to reach that community at their level, at their speed, in the best way for them. And one of those things can be discussed with the uh, idea of healing, okay? So in many cultures that are substandard living, Healing is a huge thing, and it happens quickly. When they receive your peace, they open themselves up for a miracle healing in their body. Now, miracle healings happen in the United States and in affluent cultures, but not to the number and the extent that they do in others. I believe it can, but even many times when a person receives your peace, they don't even consider that God could use you to heal their body because they already have these problems solved. They, you know, they had a a repair done on their eyes, got the cataracts removed, they see well. They don't need you to anoint them with oil and pray that that would happen. The surgeon already replaced their knee, things like that. But whether the person is rich or poor, they are dealing with emotional heartbreak. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to go and heal the brokenhearted. Hey, you and I have that spirit. And the Spirit is upon our disciples that we're training as they grow up in the Lord and they learn to walk in that anointing. That same Spirit's upon them to heal the brokenhearted. So when someone receives their peace, healing can begin happening right there at the cash register. Healing can be happening over the back fence. God begins working with them in a powerful way, and it's not just about, well, let's sit down and let me tell you the doctrine you need to know so you can be saved. It's this holistic transformation of the person's life so that they, they are then shaped and ready to go out and do what was done for them to others. You see, as Jesus worked past Andrew and he went to Simon, Andrew now is watching because how does discipleship work? The rabbi would walk in front and the disciple would always walk behind. The, the disciple was never even to walk beside the rabbi. Remember, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. The problem there, Simon was trying to come alongside the Lord or steer him in a different direction. Say, hey, no, 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 don't think like that. And Jesus says, get behind me, get back in your place. Because to try and get past me, try and, try and control this thing is to be like Satan. And so, Andrew is following Jesus. So when he sees what happens in Simon's life, 
Well, Andrew's now learning what it is he's supposed to do. And Simon sees what Jesus does in this woman's life, and he's learning what he's supposed to do. So when Jesus is off the scene, Peter and John go walking up to the temple, and they see this man, and they reach down, grab him by the hand, and say, rise up and walk. Why? They learned what to do by watching Jesus. They didn't just have facts and information. They had this practice that they had developed in. So there's so much in depth that we need to understand about the Gospels, revisit the Gospels, and hold ourselves accountable. Because the bottom line of a disciple is not someone who knows the Word of God, not someone who reads the Word of God, but someone who does it. So Jesus, when he says, I have lost none except the one reserved for judgment, these 11 are doers. They are not people who've memorized all the doctrine. They already had that memorized probably before they met him. But they are people who have learned the process and are going to go out and continue this thing, and it will never stop because they're going to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So I want to encourage you to check out the Disciple Maker material. If you don't have a need for curriculum to teach to other people, but you would like to see the secrets to making disciples, for $1 you can get into that Disciple Maker series and try it out for 30 days. It's a $1 trial offer. You can get your dollar back if you don't like it, but we've had scores of people tell us how much they love this series and what it's done for them. But if you go in there and you just want to watch that training and then get out before it costs you anything more, you can do that without talking to anybody, okay? Some people feel weird about that. Well, I don't want to ask for the refund. I don't want to ask to cancel. You just go into your membership da dashboard and you can go up there and click cancel and get out, no questions asked. But if you decide that you do want a material that is going to help the disciples that you're making, help establish them in all that Jesus taught, we believe this is the best resource available for doing that right now, and we want to make it available to you as reasonably as possible. So you'll see there's two options. That $1 option leads into a monthly membership, a subscription. Uh, the other one is a one-time payment that is less than the one-quarter price of that leading curriculum that we mentioned earlier. So check it out. We believe it will be of great value to you and your ministry as you build the kingdom and as you bring in disciples who remain.